I'm really very pleased to introduce Jane Hoppen, who will be the moderator of this first session. She's a professor of biologic sciences and deputy director of the Center for Human Health and Environment at North Carolina State University. Dr. Hoppen's research focuses on how epidemiologic evidence can inform mechanisms of disease from environmental exposures. And she is currently leading an NIH funded study of PFAS exposure in the Cape Fear River Basin. She is an environmental epidemiologist who work, whose work focuses on the impacts of chemical exposures on human health. She currently has funded research projects evaluating the impact of pesticide exposure to residents in the banana, banana growing region of Costa Rica and assessing exposure to novel and legacy PFAS among residents in the Cape Fear River Basin in North Carolina. She has over 200 publications related to exposure assessment for chemicals in the environment and health outcomes. She previously spent almost 15 years at NIEHS working on agricultural, on the agricultural health study. She re received her SM and SCD in environmental health and epidemiology from the Harvard E.H. Chan School of Public Health. And we are very lucky to have Jane as a member of the study committee. Jane, could I turn things over to you, please? Sure, thanks, Ned. Thanks for that introduction. Um, so I'm excited today for our um, panel on the overview of putative health effects. Uh, our first speaker will be uh, Dr. David Savitz. He's a professor of epidemiology in the Brown University School of Public Health with joint appointments in obstetrics and gynecology and pediatrics in the Albert Medical School. His epidemiological research has addressed environmental hazards in the workplace and community, reproductive health hazards, and environmental in influences on cancer. His research includes studies of miscarriage, preterm birth, and pregnancy complications, and he has addressed health effects of non-ionizing radiation, pesticides, drinking water, treatment byproducts, and perfluorinated compounds. Dr. Savitz is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and was awarded the David Rawl Medal for Distinguished Leadership as Chair of Study Committee. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Savitz. Thanks, David. Thanks, Jane. I'm gonna try to share my screen and we'll see if it works as uh, planned. Uh, give me just one second here. I just wanna get it on the slideshow. Slideshow from beginning. Okay, it, that, that looks good to me. Is that hopefully it looks good to uh, the, the audience as well, more importantly. Um, it, thanks. Excellent, thank you. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me. This is, a, uh, I'm sure you figured it out by now. This is a, you've got a challenging task. I mean, a lot of people have reviewed the evidence and I am grateful that, that an expert group is reviewing it with an eye to these specific issues, because I don't think that's been done before or certainly not done in a, in a methodical way. So, so you're really, uh, you're, you're filling a very important niche in this area. I'm gonna give you, it's by necessity, an aerial view and it's a subjective view. I guess that, that goes without saying in any talk that someone gives in a, broad literature. It's not a, a, a neutral, uh, you know, summary of, of hundreds of studies. It's, it's an interpretation. It's, it's, it's a review with interpretation, obviously. And uh, I'll be happy to entertain questions as you may want to follow up on that. So let me start off with uh, some of the distinctive challenges uh, that, that, you know, that there are generic challenges in studying environmental toxicants and, and health outcomes, of course. But there are some particular things about PFAS. I mean, first of all, we haven't been interested in it for all that long, so it hasn't been monitored for extended periods of time, maybe a, uh, early measurements back, maybe a decade. Uh, and so when we're ex reconstructing exposure, we don't have a lot of anchors uh, from environmental measurements uh, to look to. Uh, secondly, and I'll come back to this, there's a real pot potential for reverse causality. The, the exposure biomarkers are, are determined by many factors, of course, including what's in the environment, but clearly there's a, an influence of uptake and metabolism that can be correlated with or indicative of early disease even. Um, of late, and as you know, is obvious in the Cape, Cape Fear uh, uh, River area, 
Uh, there are a variety of chemicals under the rubric of PFAS, and it's, it gets into some of the usual challenges of addressing mixtures. And finally, in the environmental sources, there are multiple and poorly defined exposure sources through a wide range of consumer products. Uh, these chemicals obviously have a, a lot of different industrial uses, and therefore, there are many different pathways by which people are exposed. I'm going to focus on drinking water supplies, and there's, there's a reason for that, of course, is that this is one of the few ways in which we've seen clear and, and even extreme gradients in levels of exposure related to the, the contamination. Um, community supplies, of course, are more easily addressed than, than individual private wells, simply because uh, in, in assigning exposure to a large number of people, uh, community supplies uh, and measurements in the supplies or reconstruction, I should say, of the levels uh, allow for that. In many places, not everywhere, but relative to a lot of other environmental toxicants, drinking water contamination has been relatively free of confounding. Recording and in progress. And the reason I say that is because there's, in, in contrast to, to living near busy roadways and so on, which are so entangled with socioeconomic factors, uh, very uh, often, uh, to a large degree, the water uh, contamination is simply a function of where the where the military base happened to be or where the waste site happened to be in some very remote location. Um, there are ways of reconstructing historical exposure to drinking water when it's uh, particularly when it's from groundwater contamination. Um, the uh, one of the challenges, though, of course, is the population size needs to be sufficient for studying rare outcomes, even with drinking water supplies in community exposures uh, that hasn't been easy. So beyond the sort of special exposure, if you will, from contaminated uh, drinking water supplies, there are multiple sources of, of what is truly ubiquitous background exposure. We all have measurable levels. And it's through some combination, probably if I was going to put them in order of what we, we think we know, it's food and food wrapping. Uh, all drinking water has some measurable levels, and then a range of other uh, consumer products make contributions. Um, the reason we look to biomarkers, of course, is exactly this situation. The exposure sources are diverse, not easily reconstructed. so. In some ways, that can be the ideal situation for an integrative biomarker that summarizes across these, uh, these sources. Now, here it depends very much on, for the long chain PFAS, <clears throat> the biomarkers reflect reasonably pr prolonged exposures. And again, this is a generalization, but on the you know, two to four, maybe five years half-life for long chain PFAS, for short chain PFAS, of course, it's, it's much shorter. Now, this is where I get into, and I'm not alone, but I may have a particular view on this, the concerns about why biomarkers levels vary in the absence of a distinctive source. Why do we all have different measurable levels? And as I said, there's this concern with reverse causation and confounding by, by physiologic variation or even the presence of, of disease. Now, getting into the specific epidemiologic work that's been done, there, there are a small number of studies of large populations with substantial exposure due to contaminated water. And those are the, it's that combination of large populations, substantial exposure, and contaminated water that allows us to uh, both have a gradient that is informative of, of higher and lower levels, know where the gradient comes from, the contaminated drinking water, and to varying degrees, even reconstruct what the situation was historically given that source. I also mentioned there's an ongoing ATSDR study, a multi-site study in progress, uh, seven sites, Aaron Bell is leading one of those, and there's six other sites besides the New York area where it's looking at historical drinking water contamination that's led to exposures, uh, mostly due to proximal military bases. And then I haven't done a, a PubMed search to give you some impressive numbers, although I suspect you have. Uh, there are hundreds of studies of variation in background exposure. Basically, anybody with a cohort that has collected and stored uh, biospecimens is able to look at this issue. And of course, uh, many, uh, many investors investigators have. 
Now here's, uh, again, uh, I, I won't keep giving you the disclaimer, but these are, this is my interpretation of looking at the overall picture of what do we know and with what levels of certainty. It seems the, the, the evidence from my view is most persuasive of increases in serum cholesterol, particularly LDL. And insofar as we can look at dose response gradients, this is not uh, one where it's, there's no uh, apparent association until you get to high levels of exposure. In fact, the incremental cholesterol levels per unit change seem to actually, if anything, be more dramatic and pronounced at the lower exposure levels. Um, this is both a shift in the distribution of cholesterol levels and uh, correspondingly an increased proportion with hypercholesterolemia. Second thing, and this is again, uh, uh, Ted mentioned this, reduced antibody response to vaccines, particularly in children. There's been more replication and more certainty in children, possibly in adults as well. Uh, there's pretty consistent evidence for elevated liver enzymes, particularly ALT, which is one of the markers of subclinical dysfunction uh, of the liver and may again be related to the changes in cholesterol. And this is one where, again, I may put more credence in it than some others do, but uh, kidney cancer, you know, for a number of these outcomes, only the, the C8 science panel studies had, had shown an association. So it's a clear dose response gradient, pronounced risk, and so on. And this recent and I think rather clear replication from the NCI study, uh, I think really it's it's only two studies but that's one more than many of the uh, many of the associations that uh, are uh, we, we're looking at and I think it's really uh, as I said it's I don't want to make it you know imply that it's absolutely compelling but I think it, it does deserve to be taken quite seriously going on to those with moderate support then let me talk about a couple of outcomes that are clearly associated within the C8 health project research that's been done but have not either been replicated or refuted with other studies, partially because they're rare diseases, not the easiest outcomes to study, namely ulcerative colitis and uh, testicular cancer. So again, the same pattern, strong dose response gradient, but isolated findings from a single study. Thyroid disease is interesting where there's, there's it's complicated. It's, even uh, it, it, across the studies, it's inconsistent with respect to whether the concern is with hyper or th hypothyroidism. A number of studies have found sex specific effects with rather pronounced sex differences in risk, women at much higher risk. And uh, the studies of thyroid hormones have not really sorted this out in a definitive way. So it seems to affect thyroid function and thyroid disease, PFAS does, but, but the way it does or the impact of it is, uh, remains a bit, bit unclear. And finally, evidence of reduced birth weight, which uh, a consistent small reduction, but again, uh, there's a possibility of reverse causality uh, contributing to that. Now, this is where it gets, th this interpretation of clinical biomarkers can be challenging where we, we study them because we know they have a relationship to, to, to me, you know, to, to uh, real health problems, clinical disease. But without that anchor of seeing the whole sort of chain of events, it kind of leaves them sitting out there in an ambiguous state. With regard to infectious disease, I think the results that I've seen, at least overall, remain mixed at best. There's some hints or weak suggestions but certainly the evidence for reduced antibody response is much clearer than the evidence for development of increased risk of developing infection. For cardiometabolic disease, my read of it is it remains, it remains negative. I mean, I don't, you know, you should never say never, and it doesn't mean that the, the issue has been put to rest uh, completely, but despite some, some pretty serious efforts to look at this outcome in relation to PFAS, it has yet to be demonstrated with any, any uh, level of confidence. And finally, liver disease, which would be of great interest, non-malignant liver disease, there's just simply been little research that this is not something that is uh, uh, sort of in the typical repertoire of what epidemiologic studies are able to do. A number of other outcomes have had extensive research, a lot around 
uh, perinatal and uh, early life conditions. I think in part because we all know that's a vulnerable period. And to be honest, though, I think in part because there are a lot of birth cohorts studies with biomarkers available, and it lend, they, they lend themselves to an exploration of the role of PFAS, uh, miscarriage and preterm birth, uh, uh, the adiposity, various measures of fat uh, deposition, neurodevelopment, a few studies of other cancers that have been decidedly uh, mixed at best, uh, prostate and ovary, uh, sometimes bladder, possibly some others. So again, in looking at the uh, overall sort of uh, uh, view of the reflecting on the patterns, there is this preponderance of evidence on clinical biomarkers in relation to background variation. That's where the bulk of the research is, uh, looking at the relationship between biomarkers of PFAS and clinical biomarkers. Uh, the expected disease consequences have not been certainly clearly or consistent consistently found. But then the other hand, there's been relatively limited research on clinical disease endpoints. And in part, it's a logistical issue. It's easier to study uh, changes in cholesterol than it is the incidence of myocardial infarction uh, for the obvious reasons in terms of numbers and, and the frequency of these events. But it's interesting that it applies across uh, infection, uh, cardiometabolic disease, and liver enzymes, the same story of, uh, 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 of biological impact without demonstrating uh, necessarily uh, a clinical disease. Let's see here. Um, OK. So the um, again, there's if, if for the research agenda, of course, is, is not that we want to uh, necessarily, uh, you know, we, we don't wish in a public health sense for more populations with elevated uh, above background exposure. But these are the places I think where we have the most to gain. And uh, uh, as I said, I think we're, we're learning a lot and we'll learn a lot more from studies in Europe, also the ATSDR study. Um, Right now, regulatory limits, for, with very few exceptions, are based solely on reliance on toxicology. I mean, Jamie can speak to that, of course, but it, it, the, the research is not advanced to the point where we can comfortably invoke it for, for suggesting where human health effects uh, may occur based on the epidemiology. And then I'll note one other consideration. I mentioned drinking water as a source of great interest, but also there's been very little research on environmental pathways other than drinking water. Uh, there are concerns about, for example, use of uh, treated sewage for crops, which can contain high levels of PFAS and be absorbed into the, into the uh, crops, of game fishing or, or uh, deer and so on. Uh, we don't think they're as important, but those have yet to be really uh, uh, looked at closely. So what are the, the, the big challenges? Um, we don't know a lot yet about the re more recently introduced short chain uh, forms of PFAS. The, the bulk of the research is on PFOA and PFOS. There's some studies which have included other long chain forms of PFAS, but very little on the recently introduced ones. And these have some challenges in that exposure reconstruction requires modeling. And with a shorter half-life, there may be some greater challenges in doing that accurately. Uh, obviously, we can only study uh, the chronicity of exposure to the extent that the exposure has existed for a long time. So if you ask me, you know, what, what does Gen X do over a 20 or 30 year time frame? Of course, we have no idea until the time passes and it's, it's uh, you know, we can then do the research to answer those questions. And this is where, again, I'll, I'll maybe I'm, I am setting the stage for Jamie, but this question of whether to presume similar health consequences for other forms of PFAS, I'm not optimistic that epidemiology is really gonna be able to sort of fine tune that and make that determination. I think there is much greater opportunity for looking at uh, mechanisms and, and toxicologic work to, uh, to provide that kind of answer. So let me uh, unshare, stop share, okay? And uh, stop there. And again, I assume we'll have the discussion will follow rather than anything right now. Is that, uh, is that right, Jane? Um, I thought we had 10 minutes for- Oh, okay. Now?
I'm not trying um, to run away. I'm, I'm here. Yeah. So my question is kind of a broader question. So um, it's you like just immediately lumped all PFAS. Yes. And do you think that for the legacy PFAS, we should just consider any PFAS, you know, like, should we, should we spend any time thinking about PFOA separately from PFOS or just consider the whole class as a whole and move from there? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, boy, that's, you know, again, based on the epidemiology, the answer is very simple. We have no idea. Okay, let's start with that. So empirical evidence that they should be summed. It was interesting when they were, and I think it's still that way with the regulations. Some people add PFO and PFOS. Some people throw other things in and it's, it's totally arbitrary basically. I think the potential for error, I think that in the face of ignorance, I'm inclined to do more lumping than splitting. And, and I recognize that either way, you're risking making a mistake if you're throwing in innocuous things with harmful things. But I think that under the current circumstances, I guess there's not good evidence to indicate we should separate them. And they do at least share some general chemical and I think physiologic, biologic features, so. Thanks. Uh, looks like Ned has a question. <clears throat> Yeah. Hey, uh, David, thanks so much for a great sure. presentation. Thank you. Um, I, I, I noticed the one cancer that you put on the slide of um, strong evidence is the one, can, the one condition in the whole list that we don't have a screening test. <laughs> right. um, and uh, I, w I wonder if you, if you have a feel for whether the um, increased uh, relative risk or the absolute risk increase would be enough to justify doing imaging studies, uh, even in the setting where we don't have proof that imaging studies and like patients with a family history of kidney cancer make any difference. Well, you know, it's, 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 it's what makes your, your committee's task interesting and challenging. I mean, I think that in the spirit of, of good old fashioned clinical epidemiology, there are very well defined reasons to consider uh, different, um, you know, different screening, different, different algorithms, depending on baseline risk. Uh, they do it with, you know, breast cancer screening. If you have a family history, you're kind of in a different bin and so on. I don't know, I honestly don't know quantitatively if, if under the assumption that what we've seen is causal, um, whether that would put them in a truly different bin. I would actually have to sort of see what, what do they do with kidney cancer with other, um, what do they do with smokers? Do they do some different algorithm? Smoking is very clearly related to kidney cancer. And you could ask the question, well, does that put them into a, a different screening um, uh, uh, category? There's a, again, and this is also true with any screening program, there is the sort of um, this sort of dual issue there of, of doing something in response to people who know they've been exposed, they are concerned, and they want to do something. Okay. On the other hand, the 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 sort of um, responsibility not to scare them further. Okay. Not to. In other words, there are people, and again, we've been confronting this since the work in the Mid Ohio Valley. They've had elevated exposure. What do I do now? And well, we we want to eliminate the exposure for sure. And we, uh, you know, and in many cases, I'm afraid it's just we hope for the best. But I would look at it quantitatively, and I would try to look at it in the context of other known predictors of risk of broadly similar magnitude, and see what we've been doing clinically, what what's warranted in that regard. Yeah, I. It's it, it's a really interesting issue. I mean, there's a not not that it's directly um, uh, relevant, but ovarian cancer is very interesting in that yep. we can identify women at increased risk for ovarian cancer, and even with that um, screening with uh, with uh, uh, <clears throat> laparoscopic. Uh, has no evidence of improved outcomes. Well, that, that was going to say that's the other end of the equation. Of course, is that 
there are cancers and other diseases you can detect early and know their fate, but, and, and people, I guess, you know, have a right to know if they wish to know where, where things are headed, but it's quite different than, let's say, in the case of, surprisingly, in the lung cancer screening of, of all diseases, that that early detection of, of lung cancer seems, from what I've read, is, has clear benefit. Uh, again, so it's, it's a, but I think that for public health benefit, it has to be both elements, that the risk is high enough to generate a different algorithm, the earlier detection has expected meaningful benefit. Um, it, it, you know, that, that again, I, that would be the standard I think is pretty, pretty conventionally used, that uh, US Preventive Services Task Force has thought through these issues a lot when it comes to screening. All right, any more questions for David? 